This is the first video in a new video series I'm doing on linear algebra. Now, linear algebra is such an important topic. Um, I decided to um, create some videos and um, create some course materials. Um, so I have decided that um, when I make this video series, I'm going to base it on chapters one through six of Lay's Linear Algebra and its Applications third edition. Um, I chose the Lay Linear Algebra textbook because um, it's a textbook that's very popular and they use it at the University of Florida. And most people who use this book or most institutions that use this book from my understanding um, cover chapters one through six in their course. So I'm going to do a video series over chapters one through six. Chapter one covers linear equations. Um, starts off a little slow, but things get more interesting toward the end of the chapter. Chapters two and three cover matrix algebra and determinants. Uh, chapter four is about vector spaces and chapter five is about eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And chapter six will deal with orthogonality and least, least squares. Um, so again, it does start a little slow. Um, what we're gonna be doing is a lot of things that you already know how to do if you've taken pre-calculus. If you've ever solved a system of two equations and two unknowns or three equations and three unknowns. And that's exactly what we're gonna do. And um, we're just going to um, introduce some new notation and think about what would happen if we happen to have n unknowns. So rather than just having two equations with two unknowns x and y or three equations with three unknowns x, y, and z, and we're going to think about systems of equations involving x sub 1 through x sub n. Now because so much of this is a review, I have written down some definitions in advance, excuse me, and I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. Um, so that way we can get to the good stuff. And so this video will be about um, solving systems of linear equations with elementary row operations, which is the very uh, first um, topic in the very first section of the Lay Linear Algebra textbook. Now I'm using the same um, numbering convention that I use in other video series. 1.1 um, stands for the chapter and section from the textbook. So this is from uh, chapter one, section one of the lay textbook that we're, we're doing and um, that we're covering. And this last number just indicates the, the number of the video in, this, in the series for that particular section. So this is the first video over section or for, over chapter one, section one from the lay linear algebra textbook. Um, so first we have a definition, a linear equation in the variables x sub one through x sub n is just an equation that can be written in this form. You've got a constant times x sub one plus a constant times x sub two plus a constant times x sub three and so on until you get to a constant times x sub n equals a different constant. And don't let those subscripts bother you. They're just stand-ins for numbers and those subscripts just tell you which variable they're multiplying. So a sub two multiplies the variable x sub two. a sub n multiplies the variable x sub n. A sub one through a sub n are just constants that are called the coefficients of the equation. And this constant on the right hand side, it's just called B. These are usually given to you. Um, so here's an example. If I have x2 or x sub two equals two times the square root of six minus x sub one plus x sub three. That turns out to be a linear equation. Now it's not already written in this form, but we could easily take this equation and write it in this form by writing a list of equivalent equations. So we could distribute that two and we would get that. And then if we add two times X sub one to both sides and then subtract X sub three, we get this. So A sub one is two, A sub two is an implied one a sub three is a negative one and B is square root of six. Since we can take this equation and write this, write it in this form, this is called a linear equation in the variables X sub one through X sub three. Now, if I have an equation that looks like this, This is not a linear equation because that x sub three variable is being squared. Oops. Now this is not a linear equation because you have x sub one and x sub two multiplying each other. Oops. 
this is not a linear equation because of the square root. So this is this makes it nonlinear. This term makes it nonlinear, and that term makes it nonlinear. So all of these are nonlinear equations. Those are not the types of equations that we're primarily interested in linear algebra. Now, a system of linear equations, also known as a linear system, is just a collection of one or more linear equations involving the same variables. If we're talking about n variables, we'll just denote those by x of 1 through x of n. And so the example that they have in the lay textbook, in the third edition at least, is you have 2 times x sub 1 minus x sub 2 plus 1.5 x sub 3 equals 8 and x sub 1 minus 4 times x sub 3 equals negative 7. Since I have two equations that involve the variables x sub 1, x sub 2, and x sub 3, that is a system of two equations and three unknowns, x sub 1 through x sub 3. Now, a solution of a system is just a list of num numbers. It's an ordered n-tuple that makes, the, uh, makes each of these equations true when the s sub 1 through s sub n are substituted for the x sub 1 through x sub n. Um, again, don't let this notation bother you. Um, normally, we would call these variables x, y, and z when we're looking at three um, f or systems of equations with three variables. Um, but once we get beyond three, we usually use different, um, we use the subscripts. Um, so n could be 10. So this might be s sub 1 through s sub 10. And this might be x sub 1 through x sub 10. But a solution is just a set of numbers or a list of numbers that you can plug in here that will cause the equation to be satisfied or this first equation to be satisfied and that second equation to be satisfied at the same time. So here's an example. And um, this system of equations is satisfied by uh, quite a few numbers, but one solution of the system is five um, and 6.5 and three. And if you're not sure that that works, let's just substitute and see. So if we replace x1 with five and x2 with 6.5, and x um, sub three with three. Let's see what we get. Hopefully we get eight. We have 10 minus 6.5 plus 4.5. Uh, 10 minus 6.5 is 3.5. And 3.5 plus 4.5 is eight. And that's the right hand side. So. This point, x1, x2, x3, or s sub 1, s sub 2, and s sub 3, if you prefer, so that we can stick with this convention over here, um, satisfies this. If we replace this x1 with 5, x2 with 6.5, and x3 with this, we do get 8. Now, in order to be a solution of the system, it has to satisfy, the point has to satisfy this equation and this equation. So let's plug in x1 and x3 to this one and show that we, we get negative 7. So with the second equation, we just have x1 minus 4 times um, x3 or x sub 3. We're replacing x1 with 5 and x sub 3 with 3. So this is a 5 minus 12, and 5 minus 12 is negative 7, so that checks out. Okay, so we have a solution of this system of equations. Now that's just one solution. It turns out that there are infinitely many solutions to this system of equations. This actually represents a plane in three-dimensional space, and this represents a different plane. Um, those planes intersect on a line in three-dimensional space. So this is just one of infinitely many points on that line. The solution set of a linear system is a set of all possible solutions. And that set of solutions might consist of a single point or it might be empty, there may be no solutions, there may be no way that this equation and this equation can be satisfied at the same time, or there may be infinitely many solutions, like the infinitely many solutions where this plane intersects with this plane and we're on that line of intersection. Um, so we'll, we will talk more about this solution set later. I'm not going to state the solution set of uh, this uh, system of equations at this time. Now we can we will say that two systems are equivalent to each other if they have the same solution set. So let's say I take these two equations from up here and I add them together. Well, this equation plus this equation gives me two x one plus x one is three x one. Then we're subtracting x two, and then we have one point five x three 
uh, minus four times x3, so that's negative 2.5 times x sub three. I'm just adding those together and eight plus negative seven is one. So when I added those together, I'm going to replace the first equation with this equation. I'll leave the second equation alone. Now it's not 100% obvious, but this is an equivalent system to this equation because the solution of this system of equations or the set of solutions of this system of equations is the same as the set of solutions or solution set of this system of equations. Here we're seeing where this plane and this plane intersect, they intersect along the line. Now we're looking at where this plane and this plane intersect. Uh, this plane is different from both of those planes but this plane and this plane intersect on the same line where this plane and this plane intersect. So if this is system number one and this is system number two, systems number one and two are equivalent to each other because the planes here and the planes here intersect along the same line. Now, if you've taken pre-calculus, you're familiar with solving systems of two equations and two unknowns. If I've got two equations and two unknowns here, we could call those unknowns x sub 1 and x sub 2, or we could call them x and y like we do in a pre-calculus class or um, just an algebra class. Um, this represents a line in the xy plane, and this represents a line in the xy plane. So I could call this line number 1, and I could call this line number 2. When I'm finding the solution set of this system of equations, I'm just finding the place where those two lines intersect. I might denote this line by L sub one and I might denote this line by L sub two. So finding the solution set of the system of equations is equivalent to finding when these two lines intersect each other. Now, if you've taken pre-calculus, you know that one way that you can solve this system is you can add these two equations together and that will um, actually eliminate x in this case and that will allow us to find y. So if we add these equations together, we get y equals two. So we know these two lines cross when y is equal to two. Now, if y is equal to two, um, then I have uh, x minus two times two, so that's x minus four equals negative one. If I add that negative four to both sides, I get x equals negative one plus four or x equals three. So the solution of this um, system of two equations and two unknowns is x equals two or x equals three, y equals two. Now, another way that you could find that point is just by graphing these two lines. Um, one way that I might do that is I might let uh, y equal zero when y equals zero, I see that x must equal negative one. So I'm right here. Or when x equals zero, I've got negative two y equals negative one. So y must be one half. So that's one way that I can sketch line number one. I could do the same thing here. I could plot the intercepts. Um, when x equals zero, we get three times y equals three. So if I divide both sides by three, I get y equals one. And then over here, if I let um, y equals zero, I have negative x equals positive three. So if I multiply both sides by negative one or divide by negative one, I get x equals negative three. So this line passes through this point and this point and it also passes through that point. If I had a perfect grid, I could it, it would be more obvious um, that, that that's a straight line. Um, but these two lines cross at x equals three, y equals two. And one way that you can check that the solution set of this is x equals three, y equals two, is you could substitute that into both equations. If I put a three here and a two here, I have three minus two times two. So it's three minus four is negative one. That, that checks out. If I substitute in a three for X and a two for Y, I've got negative three plus six equals positive three. That works. Um, so with this system of two equations and two unknowns, one possibility is that we could have one point of intersection where those lines cross. So we have one solution. 
um, and it happens to be three, uh, two for these two lines. Now, the uh, another possibility is that you could have um, no solutions. Now, this system actually has no solutions. If I add these two equations together, what I end up with is zero equals two, and zero never equals two. That corresponds to the case when the two lines are parallel to each other. That means the lines never intersect. X minus two y is negative one. That's the same as this uh, line over here. So we know that it crosses um, the y axis. This first line crosses the y axis when y equals one half. And the line also passes through the point x equals three, y equals two. We end up with something that looks like this. That's line one. Um, now for line number two, um, we see that if x equals zero, we have two y equals three. So y is equal to three divided by two or one and a half. And it's parallel to this line. So we should see exactly the same um, slope. It's just moved up one unit. And you can check for yourself if that's true then the point x equals three, y equals three should be on this line. Um, if I substitute in three for x and three for y, I have negative three plus three or plus six is three, which is satisfied. So these lines never intersect and we have no solutions or no solution. Now, if I take this, these two lines and I add them together, those two equations and add them together, I get zero equals zero, which is always true. Um, or you could just take this second equation and multiply it by negative one. If you multiply this by negative one, you get positive x minus two y equals negative one. You find out that is exactly the same line as that line. Um, so in that case, we actually have um, infinitely many solutions. And the solutions consist of all the points on that, that one line. So that's line one and line two. So you have infinitely many solutions. Now it turns out that these three cases um, are not, um, do not depend on the fact that we have two equations and two unknowns. Um, whenever we have a system of linear equations, we're going to be in one of these cases. We're either going to have no solutions or no, no solution or one solution or infinitely many solutions. We're gonna verify that when we get to section 1.2, um, but that's just a fact. Um, for right now, it's just a fact and we will prove it later. So it's never the case that a system of linear equations will say have three solutions. If we're dealing with linear equations, we either have one solution, infinitely many solutions, or no solutions. Now, if a system of equations has a solution, we say that that system is consistent. So when we're looking at these three examples, this system of equations is consistent we say it is a consistent system of equations because it has a solution. And this is also a consistent system of equations because it has solutions. It has infinitely many solutions. Now this is an inconsistent system because it's not possible for this equation and this equation to be satisfied at the same time.
Now we can write our systems of equations in what's called matrix notation. A matrix is a rectangular array of numbers. And we say that the size of a matrix, um, it's um, indicating the number of rows and the number of columns of a matrix. An M by N matrix is a matrix of size M by N. That's how we pronounce that, M by N. And this indicates the number of rows and this indicates the number of columns. So you're thinking rows by columns, here's a mnemonic. So you have a memory device, like RC Cola. Rows come first, rows then columns. So if I have this system of equations, I might be interested in just the coefficients of these equations. Now there's no x1 here, so it's implied that that's a zero x1. Of course, it's implied that that's a one times x sub two, and that's a one times x sub one right there. Um, if this is my system of equations, if I just look at the coefficients of x sub one, x sub two, and x sub three on the left-hand side, that's 0, 1, and 4, 1, 3, and 5, 3, 7, and 7. This right here is called the coefficient matrix. Or the matrix of coefficients. of the system of equations. Now I might denote that matrix by a capital letter, so I'll call this A. Now, if I want to indicate the size of A, sometimes we're going to indicate the size of A, that's the number of rows by the number of columns with a subscript. So this is a three by three matrix. That three indicates that we have three rows. So I have a first row, a second row, and a third row. This is row number one, this is row number two, and this is row number three. And then this, this three indicates the number of columns that we, our matrix has. Well, that's a column and that's a column and that's a column. So this is the first column. This is the second column and that's the third column. So we have three rows by three columns. So the size of A is a three by three, it's a three by three matrix. So that is called the coefficient matrix. And it just came from taking the coefficients of X sub one, X sub two and X sub three. Once they're arranged in order like this with all the X's in the first column, X sub one's in the first column, X sub two's in the second column, and X sub three's in the third, where everything is arranged in just the right way like that, um, that's gonna be the coefficient matrix or matrix of coefficients. Now, if we take this matrix of coefficients and then we add a column for this right hand side, we get what's called the augmented matrix of the system. So it's going to look just like this matrix over here. You leave that alone. And then over here, we add a column for the negative five, negative two, and six.
So the augmented matrix, what you have is the coefficient matrix over here, or what would have been the coefficient matrix. And then you just tack on the um, column of constants. And that's from the right hand side of the equation. And I'm going to use RHS for right hand side. The size of this matrix, I'll call this the matrix B just to have a label for it. Well, I've got one, two, three rows. And now I have one, two, three, and then I added a fourth column um, for the right hand side. So this is a three by four matrix. Or we could say that the size of B is three by four. Now, when we're trying to solve a system of linear equations or a linear system, um, basically the strategy is that we're trying to replace the system of equations that we have by an equivalent system that is easier to solve. Roughly what we're going to do is use the x sub i term in one equation where i could be you know, some number between one and n to eliminate the x sub i terms in the others. So we're going to use the x's to eliminate x's. If we had y's, we would use y terms to eliminate y's and we would use z terms to eliminate z's. Um, in general, if we've got an x sub five, we would use x sub five terms to eliminate x sub five. Um, the, basically the way we do this um, is through what's called um, elementary row operations. These are things that we can do to a matrix, which are equivalent to things that we can do to the corresponding equations. So the first elementary row operation is called replacement. So it basically says that we can take one um, row in our augmented matrix, excuse me, and replace it by the sum of itself and another row. So if I have R sub I here, I can take that and I can replace it uh, by um, R sub I plus some constant times I'll say R sub J. So plus a constant times um, a different row. And that's the same as taking one equation and then taking a constant times another equation and then adding them together and replacing that first equation with this expression right here. So that's one way we can do that. Another possibility is that we can interchange rows in our augmented rate matrix, which is just the same as writing our equations in a different order. Maybe you write the, the third equation first rather than um, third. Um, you just switch out the, the first row and the third row. That's totally fine because it's just like writing the first equation or writing the third equation before you write the first equation. Um, and then the last one is scaling. You can multiply all of the entries in a row by a non-zero constant and make a replacement as well. So you could replace um, R sub I with a constant times R sub I. Um, and that's just going to resize everything. It's like multiplying your whole equation by five. Um, it's totally fine. It does not change the solution set of the system of equations. Now we say that matrices are row equivalent if there is a sequence of elementary row operations that transforms one matrix into another. And so basically what we're doing is we're following these operations and using this strategy, trying to get rid of X terms, X sub I terms with other X sub I terms um, so that the system of equations that we started with gets simpler and simpler and simpler until hopefully um, we have a, the simplest possible description of the solution of that uh, linear system. Now, um, it's a fact that the row operations are reversible. Um, if I took an equation and I multiplied it by three, well, I could undo that by dividing it by three or um, multiplying it by one third, same thing. So if you can undo that with an equation, you can just as easily undo that with a row operation on a matrix. Um, if you switch the first row and the third row, and then you changed your mind, you could just switch them back. That'd be totally fine. Um, and if you take um, one row and you multiply it by a constant and you add it to this row, um, well, in order to undo that, well, I guess we could um, subtract this row and then divide by that constant to get that R sub J back. Um, 
yeah, I think that that's, that's what I would be doing, trying to, and I'm, I'm trying to think, should I be going back to R sub J or R sub I? Anyway, um, we can undo this too. So all of our elementary row operations are reversible. Um, so, um, you know, multiplying by a constant, of course, we're assuming that the constant is not zero because that would not be reversible. Um, and then here is a very important fact. Um, and it's the, it's the reason why we do what we do. If two augmented matrices or if augmented matrices of two linear systems are row equivalent, then the two systems have the same solution set. So we keep finding equivalent um, systems and equivalent systems and equivalent systems until the final system is as simple as possible. So let's look at an example. So my plan in this example is to use um, row operations on the system of equations itself and then find um, the solution of this system. It's going to be an ordered triple x, y, z. Notice I'm using x, y, and z rather than x sub one, y, or x sub one, x sub two, and x sub three. It's the same thing. Um, we just tend to use x and y when we have two variables. We tend to use x, y, and z when we have three variables. And once we go beyond um, three variables, that's when we use the subscripts most of the time. Okay, so I might want um, the x uh, to, uh, I, want, I might want a one X right here. I might eventually want to have an X equals a constant. Um, so in order to make that happen, I think what I'll do is I'll switch these two equations. You might say, you didn't really do anything. You're absolutely right. I didn't do anything. I'm just writing this in a different order. Now that's equivalent to doing this over here with the row um, with the um, augmented matrix. So I've got, I can write an augmented matrix for this. So I've got a zero, a one and a four for the coefficients of X, Y and Z here. And then here I have the coefficients one, three and five and the coefficients down here are three, seven, and seven. And then on the right-hand side, we've got this um, column, vector column. And um, <coughs> what I decided to do was I decided to switch this row and this row. Um, so in order to get from here to here, I'm switching the first row and the second row. And that's the same thing that I can do to get from here to here. Let's switch the first row and the second row. So I leave the third row alone. And then I write the second row first and the first row second. So we, we did this, I guess, I guess I should write it up here. We did this to this matrix to get here. And now we have the augmented matrix for this system. Now, if I want to get rid of this 3x, I can get rid of this 3x if I multiply this equation by negative 3 and add those two together. And that's a good idea because we can take any equation we want and multiply it by it a constant, that's legal. And if we take that equation multiplied by a constant and we add it to this one, we can make that replacement like we talked about right here. Um, so that's what I'll do. I'm going to replace row three or the third equation with negative three times row one plus row three. So it's like I'm taking equation number one and I'm multiplying it by negative three So I have negative three times X and then negative nine times Y minus 15 times Z equals negative three times negative two, which is six. And then I'm adding that to equation three. And this is giving me my new row three. So I have negative two Y um, minus eight Z equals 12. And if we wanted to, we could also 
divide by two. So we leave the first equation, whoops, alone. We're leaving the second equation alone. And we're replacing the third equation with the third equation plus a constant times the first equation. And that was one of the benefits for putting this here, um, having that one times X in that first row, first column position, is once I have a one times X somewhere, it's easy to take that and multiply by it just the opposite of this. So I have a positive three here, I can multiply that equation by a negative three. And then when I add them together, the X's are gone. So I'm doing exactly what we talked about here. I'm using the X term in one equation to eliminate the X term in another equation. And so this is our new row three or our new uh, equation three. So we have negative two Y minus eight Z equals 12. Now this row or this um, operation where we took the first equation and multiplied it by negative three, and then we added the third equation and then we have, we're adding those together to get a new equation three. <coughs> we can do the same thing with the rows of this matrix over here. So if row three, that can be replaced by negative three times row one plus row three. So we leave the first and second rows alone. And then we have negative three times this. So I'll have negative three plus three, which is zero. Negative three times three is negative nine. Negative nine plus uh, seven is negative two. Negative three times five is negative 15. Negative 15 plus seven is negative eight. And then negative two times negative three is positive six. Six plus six is of course 12. So we end up right here. Now at this point, if we wanted to, we could take row three and divide it by two in order to get rid of that, um, to get rid of these multiples of two. I have a negative two Y and negative eight Z and a 12. Um, but the next thing I would like to do is just to get rid of this Y entirely. Um, so rather than taking that step where I just divide this whole equation by two, I think what I'm going to do to get rid of this negative two Y is I'm going to replace row three again with row three plus two times row two. And that's because if I take this one Y here, and there's no X over here, notice, I take this one Y and I multiply it by two, then I'll have positive two Y plus some other things. And when I add them together, the Y's will cancel out from this guy, from that third equation. So I have equation three, and then two times equation two is two Y plus eight Z um, equals a negative 10. Uh-oh, maybe this is not the best example. <laughs> we add them together and that's gonna give me my new equation three. I just pulled this from the book. Um, so when we add these together, all the variables reduce and we just have zero on this side equals two and that's never true. So it turns out this system of equations has no solution. Um, you could also find out that this system of equation has no solutions by doing the same thing over here. Um, I would take row three and I'm replacing it with row three plus two times row two. So I leave row uh, one alone, I leave row two alone. So I have zero plus two times zero, which is zero. And then I have this times two is two plus negative two is zero. And then four times two is eight, eight plus negative eight is zero. And then I have uh, two times negative five is negative 10, and negative 10 plus 12 is two. As soon as you have this row of zeros here, in that part that corresponds to the coefficient matrix. And that's equal to just a, a non-zero constant over here. That corresponds to an equation that's never true. This is saying zero times X plus zero times Y plus zero times Z equals two. You're like, wait, what? How is that possible? It's not possible. Um, so that means the system of equations does not have a solution. 
So this system of equations is equivalent to this system of equations, which is equivalent to this system of equations. Um, and all of those have no solution. And they all correspond to this augmented matrix and this augmented matrix and this one and this one. So the solution um, that we would get using this augmented matrix um, or, uh, well, the solution implied by this augmented matrix is the same as the solutions implied by the others. So all of these have no solution and the original system has no solution. Now, if you're wondering, how can you tell whether you have a solution in general? Could we have just looked at that problem and uh, known in advance that we had no solution? Um, we're gonna talk about that in the next video.